Thanks, Jody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah awesome. Um, okay, so first, wow. I'm a little overwhelmed by this, to be honest. When I first uh, started doing this, the amount of interest in the startup community, never mind the local startup community, was not nearly this high. So this is a great sign that HBS is becoming more entrepreneurial. Let me do a quick survey. How many of you, it's HBS, so I get to ask you questions. You don't just get to ask me questions. How many of you are RCs? Wow, that's phenomenal. Three cases tonight? This is awesome. Um, and how many of you are ECs? <laughs> so you're the experts we'll call on. And then how many of you are neither? Just out of curiosity, where are you from? I'm a partner. A partner? Yeah, awesome. Where else? Kennedy School. Kennedy School? Community member. Community member, awesome. Um, so I have two objectives with this presentation. The first is you have plopped yourself into one of the most special and precious startup communities in the world. There are only a couple startup communities that really work in a robust fashion. Startup communities are very, very special things. And you're in the middle of one of them. And in the past, many HBS students would come here to this little island of Alston. Nobody likes to say the address is Alston, by the way. You notice that? Um, this little island of Alston and not really integrate with the community, not take advantage of the community, and not reap the benefits of being in this special microcosm. So my first objective is to give you a guide, as, a, as Jody said, a hitchhiker's guide is the uh, term I coined uh, when I created this, to give you a sense of what this microcosm looks like and how to take advantage of it. Because honestly, you would be crazy if you are at all interested in startups, at all interested, you would be crazy not to get off campus and take advantage of it and not to or, you know, really get out there and immerse yourself in it. And the second thing is that startup communities are unbelievable microcosms and powerful entities. And if you have any belief, as I do passionately, that the world is changed when startups flourish and that startups and entrepreneurs really do impact the universe in a meaningful, meaningful way, then you should know what it takes to create a great startup community. And I'm going to describe that a little bit here with this presentation. Um, so that's the, those are the objectives. I'm going to pound through the slides. There's a lot of data in here. It's posted up on my blog, which is Seeing Both Sides is the name of my blog. And I think the iLab will post it. If you can't find it, just Google my name um, and look for my blog. And if you want to chat about it, shoot me a note. Being an HBS student, this is another thing that I want to make sure I convey. Um, it's a little bit like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. You now have a golden ticket. And that golden ticket is super valuable because when you reach out to any VC, entrepreneur, CEO, CTO, HBS alum or not HBS alum, in this startup community or elsewhere in New York or in the Valley, people actually respond. It's amazing. When you, three years from now, reach out and you say, hey, I'm, so here's the scenario that I always get. You know, the email comes in, hey, Jeff, I'm an HBS student uh, interested in the following area. I'm researching this. I'm doing an IP in that. Would you take 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and give me some advice? And I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm working on. So imagine that inbound email to any VC or entrepreneur versus, hey, I'm a product manager at Google and I'm looking for a job or I'm just transitioning out of you know, Facebook and I'm looking for my next opportunity. That's, that email has a very different probability of getting the time slot desired from the person desired. So you have a golden ticket, use it. Get out there, network, take advantage of this time period, and get on people's calendars and meet people. Um, so I'm going to run through the slides, answer questions, and then I'll stick around. I know a lot of you have a lot of places to go. I'll try to be really tight. I tend to talk quickly. If I'm talking too quickly, slow me down. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, the brief story on me, Jody gave it. I'm a former entrepreneur turned VC. I was a computer science undergrad at Harvard across the river. Then I went to work at BCG in New York, the Boston Consulting Group, did my two years of PowerPoint slavery. Um, how many of you are consultants, former consultants? Yes. Um, I have a lot of funny stories about that transition. 
Uh, then I came here, HBS, knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur, pursued entrepreneurial path, and was recruited by a VC to join them. I decided I didn't want to be a VC. That seemed like a really stupid career to me at the time. Um, I decided I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. They in introduced me to a couple of their portfolio companies. I joined one of them. Uh, I was the lowest, I think one of the lowest paid jobs out of my HBS class of you know, 900. I made $65,000 a year at a post series A startup as a product manager. Uh, the good news is that company then went on to go public a year later, had a north of a billion dollar market cap, and I was lucky enough to have a few shares. So that worked out pretty well. <laughs> but at the time, the real decision for me was, do I do what many of you are deciding? Do I do the traditional career path, banking, consulting, Fortune 500, or of which you know, BCG would have paid for business school? Do I do private equity, hedge fund, VC, which would have been very lucrative? Or do I go join a little unproven Series A startup and roll up my sleeves and try to you know, make a go of the startup world? And I chose that path. It was a spectacular choice for me. Uh, and if any of you are thinking about those things, let's talk more about it. Um, I, I then uh, did two entrepreneurial ventures, both venture backed, and after a couple cycles, had the privilege of being asked to start a venture capital firm with a couple partners who had in turn been investors in me previously, some of the people who had offered me the job in the post-HBS world. And so I helped start this venture capital firm called Flybridge Capital. Went over to the dark side, as I like to say, um, hung up my entrepreneurial spikes, and joined the venture world about 10 years ago. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. We have offices in Boston, New York. We do early stage investing, software, IT, <laughs> I uh, have about 70 portfolio companies. On the side, I teach here a class, a second year class called Launching Technology Ventures. The class is targeted at people who are interested in being entrepreneurs or joining startups and being in line jobs, product management, business development, marketing, sales. Uh, we had a fantastic a couple years. We've recently created the course, had a fantastic couple years. Teaching it again this year, January term, there are two sections, myself and Tom Eisenman, each teaching one. So that's the quick backdrop on me um, and my uh, journey here. So I grew up in Boston. I have a lot of passion for Boston. I think it's a very special environment. And I'm just going to, as I said, tell you, pull back the lens and just talk about what makes a great ecosystem for entrepreneurship. And there are really four ingredients that matter. The first is ideas. Because great startups are created by people who have fantastic ideas, compelling ideas. So you need a lot of intellectual capital. The second thing is you need venture capital, because you need to take the ideas, fuel them with dollars to create companies. Third is you need angels, accelerators, and advisors to surround these ideas and these entrepreneurs to help nourish them, coach them, and develop them. And finally, you need successful companies that you can either poach from which is something we are very good at doing in the venture community, or partner with, leverage their channels, or eventually sell to. Um, if you have those four elements, you have a really robust startup ecosystem. So here in Boston, there's a lot of history uh, of the world of startups. People may know the venture capital industry was founded by an HBS professor named General Georges Dorio, who was the first, an HBS professor who invest, created a first venture capital firm, ARD, and he invested in a little technology company called DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, which ended up being a ridiculously uh, huge success, 115x return, something absurd, and it sort of fueled the venture capital industry and fueled a lot of the tech world, and all that happened in this area. There's a lot of that history, therefore, that is steeped in each of the institutions here. In terms of intellectual capital, Harvard is a jewel, but I would tell you that MIT is like a diamond. Um, if any of you have not gone over to MIT to attend some of the events there, I strongly recommend it. Strongly recommend it. Um, when I was a HBS student, the entrepreneurship department was two professors, and the one who was my mentor, I said to him, hey, I'm thinking of going over to MIT to the, uh, then it was like the 10K or 20K contest or whatever. 
And he said, Jeff, that's mediocre people looking at mediocre ideas. And that's kind of what it felt like then. Now it is unbelievable. The quality of the science, the quality of the people, um, there are phenomenal things going on over at MIT, just pouring through the seams, startups everywhere, and just begging for HBS students to run around and partner with them. Um, in 2003, I was, uh, there was a case on my company, You Promise, which was a company I um, co-founded after I left the company I joined right out of HBS. And there was a case on You Promise, and I attended the class. And afterwards, a student came up to me and said, hey, I'm working with an MIT professor on a project. Can I come talk to you about it? Again, the golden ticket. Um, I said, of course. So we met, heard about the project. One thing led to another. I ended up investing in two HBS students who had teamed with an MIT professor who had a really interesting 3D imaging technology. And they turned that into a really interesting company uh, funded by ourselves, a couple other VC firms, sold it for $100 million only a couple years into the creation of the company. Fantastic story. Um, all because these two HBS students literally just hustled, went across uh, the river, down the street, and it's, it just attended a couple of events at MIT and met one of these professors. So it totally changed their lives. Could change yours. Go to MIT. <laughs> uh, and then Harvard is an incredibly rich environment as well. And Harvard has gotten a lot better at creating a startup ecosystem available to you, this building being a great physical manifestation of that. The Engineering and Applied Sciences School is a fantastic resource. If you're interested in life sciences, Stem Cell Institute, the Wies Institute, medical school, et cetera, like get around. Again, you have a calling card that no one else has. You have a magic ticket. Use it. Everybody will be pleased to meet with you, do projects with them, and just get engaged in areas that you find interesting. There are a lot of other fantastic intellectual capital sources in the community. Babson, Tufts, uh, Terrific Engineering School, BCBU. We funded re uh, recently a semiconductor company out of BU. Um, so anyway, I just mentioned this because there's a lot of resources here that are accessible uh, in a very tight radius. A lot of patents here. Intellectual property Productivity is a huge sign of a great startup ecosystem. You see that in the main clusters around San Jose, Boston, um, and even LA. Uh, NIH funding has been a huge source of capital to fund some of the best research in the life sciences field. Uh, and that's been a fantastic boost to the, the sector. If people haven't seen this uh, hospital district in Boston, which is a, uh, two miles from here down Route 9, just you know, you see institute after institute, lab after lab, creating some really interesting technologies. Um, this community is incredibly dense because it's such a small town. You know, Boston has only 600,000 residents. It's the 20-something, I think it's 24th largest city in the country of the U.S., 10th largest metro area. It's a kind of a mid-sized city. But as this chart shows you, you know, 50, 60 percent of the workforce in the core are from the innovation economy. And so when you're sort of swimming around almost, I don't want to say everyone, but the, uh, the density of innovation economy participants is extraordinary. That geography, just to give you a quick lens, if you pull back the uh, helpful Google satellite photo, there are three clusters of innovation density in this area. One is in the 495 area, Route 495. This is where EMC is headquartered. A lot of storage, data com, big data companies are out here. In the 128 area, where a lot of uh, broad range companies, software, internet, biotech companies, medical device companies, and then here in Cambridge and Boston. And if you zoom in on Cambridge and Boston, there are two very, very dense innovation areas. One is the Innovation District, which is on the seaport. If you haven't gone there, I highly recommend it. There is an organization called Mass Challenge that is based there. There are some fantastic startups. This is just a list of some of them. I have three portfolio companies in this area alone, uh, which makes for a, 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 a pretty uh, efficient schedule when I try to do board meetings back to back. Um, but it's a wonderful area and a very diverse set of companies. Green tech, e-commerce, uh, IT, education tech, a lot of incubators, a lot of accelerators, a lot of startups. And then Kendall Square, 
Um, Kendall Square is universally known as the densest cluster of startups in the world. It's an extraordinary cluster centered all around MIT. And when I say go to MIT, that's shorthand for go to MIT and then go around Kendall Square. It's two T stops away and just up and down Akamai, every major life sciences company, someone said to me a funny story, they said for whatever reason in the last five years, there's some question in the boardroom of every major life sciences company where the answer is Cambridge. Whatever is happening in Kendall Square, whatever magic is happening, every major life sciences company is building offices and creating centers of excellence in Cambridge, in Kendall Square. And a lot of the big tech companies are there as well. One of our portfolio companies, Crashlytics, which is a mobile uh, technology company, was acquired by Twitter. And Twitter said, Cambridge, that's where we want a center of excellence. We're going to build a huge division uh, based around Crashlytics there in Kendall Square. Same with Amazon, same with Google, same with Microsoft. It's extraordinary to see. So absolutely a, a, a really important place to visit. This one building, the Cambridge Innovation Center, which is, has, actually, has anybody been to the Cambridge Innovation Center here? Okay, so a handful of you. It is um, all startups. It's a building of nothing but startups. I don't know the number. Anybody know the number of startups in the building? That they say? I think it's like 500 startups, 1,000 startups in this one building. There's a similar environment in the West Coast called Plug and Play. Um, this is the largest one in the country, in the world, and it's a phenomenal open environment. If you have a startup that you're thinking about working on, the iLab is fantastic. The Cambridge Innovation Center is also fantastic as well. Um, okay, there's a, there's a former president of Harvard University, well, I'll call he who shall not be named, who had a vision for Alston that the current president of Harvard University is now implementing. And in a few years, this area that you're in, which is what this map depicts, is going to become a third major innovation hub. The multi-billion dollar, multi-year investment plan for Alston is that this iLab becomes an anchor point and lab space and startups and accelerators and venture capitalists all cluster around it. And that's part of all the development. If you see the construction going on and you'll see it over the course of the next year or two, all of that is happening in this area to create another very dense, awesome innovation area. The reason, okay, I'll just one thing and I'll come to you. The reason density matters so much is because of serendipity. One of the most powerful forces in the world of startups is serendipity. So one of my startups, which is located in Route 128 in Waltham, was visiting the West Coast in a coffee shop. There's one executive at Facebook that they're dying to get to. She's the most senior executive on their hit list that they want to reach. It's not Sheryl Sandberg. And, um, and they're dying to get to this senior executive at Facebook. And literally in the coffee shop in Palo Alto, they bump into her. And my CEO was like so excited telling me the story. He's like, I can't believe she was right there. And I got to talk to her, and I got to make a connection. And now we're going to have a follow-up meeting, and this is really going to be great. That serendipity, that density, really matters. And so you see it here on campus, I'm sure, when you bump into professors and students and colleagues and friends. That density in a startup community really matters. It's really valuable. Um, so, and here's a comparison of dollars. Uh, so as, as this chart shows, California is a much larger environment. $14 billion invested in 2012 in venture capital. Um, Boston is much smaller in comparison. New York is smaller as well. But there is this question of density and how accessible it is. But, but look, like I said, I'm a huge fan of all three of these startup clusters. Um, we have offices at Flybridge in New York City. I lead a lot of treks to New York and I do some dinners for Harvard uh, Business School students to get access to startups in New York where we have an office, as I said. We've got a lot of portfolio companies. Same within the Valley. It's easy to get access to Kendall Square. You're two T-stops away. I would also say to you, definitely, definitely check out New York. Definitely get some exposure to that startup community. Take a weekend. Go down on the Accela. Take the Fung Wah bus for $25. Um, and again, insert yourself. You've got a golden ticket. Find companies you're interested in. 
go find the entrepreneurs that are in those companies that are alumni or interesting backgrounds and go meet them. And California, it's not quite as accessible for you sitting here, but long weekends, during vacation time, absolutely plug into that environment. By the way, one of the best resources for networking into these startup communities is in this room. Because your classmates, many, many of them came from these communities, came from these companies, did summer internships, or worked there prior. So absolutely take advantage of that as well. This just shows the density from a dollars uh, per person standpoint. The, the joke on this is that as an entrepreneur, you don't really care about how much money is in the sort of macro ecosystem. You care about how much money is there for you. So this is the um, dollars per person. Um, life sciences. Um, this community, actually, how many of you are interested in life sciences, broadly speaking? So a good number. This community is an unbelievable community for the life sciences industry. Um, it's not my industry. I don't invest in that industry. But I know from my friends who are in that industry, it is a total jewel. And so if you're interested in that industry, you should absolutely take advantage of it and get access to these companies um, and, these, and the entrepreneurs nearby. And if you're interested in the energy sector, Maybe it's clean tech. Um, here are a couple companies just to have on your radar, a couple organizations, the Clean Energy Council. Every one of these institutions has events. You should go to these events. Uh, we have a scholarship program at Flybridge that we created a few years ago called Stay in MA, which we negotiated special deals with all of the local startup organizations and innovation economy organizations to get discounts for students and then we give scholarships to cover those events. So if you're interested in attending some of these events and the $50 or $100 or $250, because these are you know profitable um, events that these people are trying to run, if that's too high a bar for you and if, you're, if that would prevent you from going, check out Stay in MA and see if you can get a, uh, a micro scholarship to attend the event. Um, these guys have terrific events. And then um, in mobile, this is a phenomenal cluster in mobile. We've had, um, I had previously here six, but one of my CEOs told me that I left out one. So seven uh, exits greater than $100 million or more in, in mobile in the last few years here. Mobile advertising companies, very strong here. I mentioned Crashlytics, um, our company. Um, a number of uh, other great mobile Companies are here, still working as independent startups. I mentioned some of them here. Here, Adelphic, Fixu, Runkeeper, Saving Star. If you're interested in the mobile industry, you know, go out and meet some of these companies. Go, go try to go to their events. They often have open houses. They often have community uh, sessions. Play around with their APIs. If you really want to impress one of these companies, tell them that you played around with their API. I did a case on Foursquare that I taught, and I had one of the Foursquare folks there. And one of my students said, yeah, you know, I downloaded the Foursquare API and dot, dot, dot. And he you know, immediately was like blown away. So if you're that technical or you have friends who are that technical, you know, play around with the APIs. All of them want developers playing with their tools. Um, there are a number of other microclusters here. If you're interested in robotics, iRobot, marketing technology is a big uh, sector here, e-commerce, online video, education is a huge sector here and an emerging one. Uh, cloud, all the spin-outs from EMC and Akamai. Um, these are companies I selected. This is my subjective view, but if you're interested in any of these sectors, these are interesting companies to research, to go visit. It's really powerful to go to their offices or to try to grab coffee in their environments, as I said, because you just you, you form a very different relationship than if you're sitting back and waiting for people to come on campus and speak. And that's the other just big message I hope I'm hammering home. The Entrepreneurship Club, the VCPE Club, everybody does great events, the iLab. And people come here, and it's on a platter, and it's easy. And all of you will do those easy things. But if you want to break into this startup world, you have to distinguish yourself. And the way to distinguish yourself is to show up. It's a low bar. <laughs> but if you just show up off campus, and then add a little value. Come with a little knowledge. I gave the API example. Maybe you, did, maybe you played around with their product and you have some feedback for them on their product. Maybe you read a couple articles that were, uh, or in some of the user group uh, forums that were critical of their product and you want to ask what their product roadmap looks like 
to address some of the issues that the users raised. So there's just these little things you can do to show that you're serious and engaged in the startup community that will really impress these entrepreneurs. Uh, I mentioned New York. Uh, New York is a phenomenal environment. As I said, you should definitely get there. Um, a number of companies have been a lot of IPOs around here. Uh, what that means is that these companies now have cash, so they're hiring. So these are great companies to look for summer internships with. Um, these are just 17 IPOs I pulled from the last couple years around here. And then uh, a handful of M&As, greater than $500 million. Again, it just means these are companies that have gotten to a certain scale level, have cash, are growing, expanding, and are great environments for you to try to plug into for summer internships, for work study projects, what have you. Um, a few companies, one of the weaknesses of Boston is that it doesn't have a lot of platform companies. Silicon Valley has a, an amazing set of platform companies. New York, not as much. Boston, not as much. Meaning companies, multi-billion dollar companies that are themselves planets or orbits that other companies rotate around. Google being a great example. Facebook a great example. Um, but here are a few. And so if you're interested in bigger companies, in being a part of a bigger organization with less risks, so to speak, these are a few companies that may be worth checking out. I think TripAdvisor, by the way, I'm just going to put a plug in for them. I'm not a shareholder. I'm not an investor. I think it's one of the most amazing companies around. In our product, man, in our class LTV and in the product management 101 class that Tom taught, we spent a lot of time talking about great product design, building tech products. And TripAdvisor was so fired up. They participated in the class. They were so fired up, they hired two uh, of our students last year to go into their management training program in product management. And, I'm, and those two students are having a great experience. Uh, it's a terrific company if you're interested in consumer internet and e-commerce. And then all the big companies are here, which means, again, you have access to them locally in a way that you uh, would be harder to pursue if you had to get on an airplane and travel. And so if you're interested in what Amazon is doing, you know, find a way to break into the Amazon Cambridge office, similarly with any of these other big tech companies. Um, I'm going to now show you a couple of slides with resources. These are places to go, events to attend, people to follow. Again, it's online, so you, can, uh, you don't have to write them all down. But if you are interested in learning more and starting to follow this community, these are some of the places that you should go to. Um, I'll just highlight Boston Inno, I think is one of the best uh, sort of online newspapers, webzines that covers the Boston innovation ecosystem, has great stories, events, good calendar, so check that out. The, I mentioned the Cambridge Innovation Center. Uh, Techstars and Mass Challenge are two very strong accelerators here, which means that a lot of students go there to help start their companies, similar to the iLab. They have a lot of resources. They're part of these programs where they get cash or be part of prizes. So if you're interested in pursuing a startup or if you want to volunteer for a really small, scrappy startup, those are good environments to check out. Uh, Mobile Mondays, Midex, a lot of terrific resources. And then these are folks that I recommend, entrepreneurs locally, that I recommend you follow on Twitter, or read their blogs. Again, this is available. I just want to highlight it here. Because like with anything, if you want to get plugged into an ecosystem, you just have to read the gurus and follow them and hear who's talked about, who's being buzzed about. And, and that's what this list covers. Um, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of some of these folks. Wayne is a halarious guy. He's the, we backed his company, Crashlytics. I mentioned them. They're acquired by Twitter. Um, it's some of the more off-color tweets. Um, his teammates. Uh, love to tease him. They even created a fake Wayne Twitter handle to uh, have like the funny sayings that he some of the things that he would say um, if because they're so audacious. Um, the HubSpot guys are very active. Darmesh and David Cancel. This blog on startups is not particular to Boston. It's just a very good blog, generally covering entrepreneurship. A lot of tips um, in the area of. Um, of entrepreneurship. I didn't mention my blog, but that might be uh, of interest to you guys as well. Um, Harvard has a huge amount of resources. And one of the things that is here are EIRs. 
So every year HBS goes out and finds a dozen or 15 folks and says to them, would you please meet with students and do office hours, 30 minutes, 45 minutes at a time, and just talk to students about career stuff, about their startups, about what's hot. Um, this year is a great lineup that the Rock Center has uh, pulled together. So these are Rock Center EIRs, Meredith McFerrin, if you haven't met her, the Rock Director organizes these. Uh, I would definitely block out time with these folks. It always amazes me when these folks who are such incredible entrepreneurs, so really accomplished, come on campus, make themselves available for office hours, and they don't sell out immediately. And I think it's just because people don't know who they are. Um, if you haven't signed up for the Trex, are, are Trex yet available to sign up for? No, because the clubs haven't made them available yet. The Trex sell out very fast. Like, it's, my understanding is it's hard to get on the Trex if you don't jump on them. And so find out how to get on the Trex. The New York Trex, the Boston Trex, I think there's going to be, the West Trek is always fantastic, uh, covering Silicon Valley, visiting a bunch of VCs and startups in Palo Alto and Mountain View. Um, the New York City startup trek last year was very successful. Uh, I helped connect them with a bunch of great companies. They found a bunch of great companies. Phenomenal New York City-based startups. A lot of HBS alum in that, air, in that community. It's a great, great place to go for uh, getting deep immersion into the startup communities. And, uh, and that's it. That's, my, that's the end of my commercial. Look, the real message is, and I want to take questions, but the real message is, as I said, you have a golden ticket. HBS is a really magical place that you now can suddenly have access to. All of Harvard tries to put these things on a platter to you and bring them to you on campus. But if you really want to distinguish yourself, if you really want to get out there and take the non-traditional route, which I highly, highly encourage you to do, obviously, um, you've got to break out of the normal things that come to you on a platter. You've got to show up, get off campus, read things that maybe not everybody else is reading, go to events that maybe you're the only HBS student there, or bring three or four friends and you're the only ones there. Just get off the campus, get out in the environment, and take advantage of all the resources that are available to you within a two or three mile radius. So that's that, and I will now take questions. Thank you. Thank you.